Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session is Pluralism Through Personal AIs and features Pooja Olhaver and Steve Omohundro. Great. Thank you, Carla. And thank you, Steve, for joining us. Steve, you're such a legend. It's such a pleasure to have you. Um, for everyone who's tuning in, if you don't know Steve, just go to Wikipedia, but uh, I'll say a few things. Um, Steve has been doing research in AI for 35 years, uh, but you have a PhD in physics. Uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting story. You are the chief scientist of AI Brain. You founded Possibility Research uh, to help ensure that AI will be beneficial to humanity. Um, and you're a prolific inventor. You designed the first data parallel programming language. You invented manifold learning and you co-developed the first image recommender system, the first attention driver, attention driven neural nets, the first lip reading system and many learning algorithms. Um, I'm not sure what all that means, but um, it sounds very profound. Um, so, and recently you were featured in the Universal Pictures documentary, We Need to Talk About AI. Uh, so welcome, Steve. Um, let's get started. I'm gonna present to you a view of uh, AI and I'd like to hear uh, what your thoughts are. This is a view from uh, Yuval Harari. He writes, and this is in a recent New York Times op-ed, the combination of biotechnology and information technology gives governments and corporations the ability to systematically hack millions of people. We are very close to the point when some governments and corporations will know enough biology, gather enough data and command enough computing power to know us better than we know ourselves. With the help of powerful new algorithms, governments and corporations will not only be able to predict our choices, but to manipulate our desires and sell us anything they want be it a product or a politician. Steve, you have a different vision of AI. What is it? Yes. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what he's saying, that AI is advancing extremely rapidly right now, uh, making, I mean, just in the last three weeks, the world's biggest language model, something called GPT-3, was released, and it's very, very powerful. So I think he's absolutely right that AI is advancing at unbelievable pace right now. Corporations and governments see the huge potential in this AI uh, to do a number of things, some good and some not so good. I think what he's missing though, is he's sort of thinking about just take today's society and plop down powerful AI, give it to the powerful corporations and governments and see what they do with it and what will happen. I think the reality of what's gonna happen is that it's also gonna serve as a tremendously empowering force for the individual. And I'm so excited to be in this conference because I see this whole conference as being empowering individuals in the face of these large social forces that are happening. And so the particular aspect of that that you and I have talked a lot about is what we're calling personal AI. And so this is an AI that is owned or at least controlled by an individual that they trust, they believe, and hopefully the reality is it has their interests, their needs, it understands their values, what they care about, and it serves as kind of their proxy in interacting with these large entities um, that gives them much more power than they would have today in that setting. So that's where I'm optimistic, and I think there's a lot of ramifications of that that we are, will explore over the next hour. Yeah, so when we talked, you mentioned that the, the personal AI is like, a, you, you, you had a model in your mind of a digital twin. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, the digital twin idea has been floating around in AI circles for about 10 years now. And that's the sort of general concept that uh, as AI becomes more powerful, what do you do with it? Um, you want, you know, in, in um, corporate setting, things like making manufacturing lines work better. A good idea is for every piece of equipment to have a sort of digital version of itself that kind of represents the current state of it, knows things like, you know, when was it last repaired, what problems has it had, you know, who's been interacting with it. It sort of represents the, the entirety of that physical entity, that physical system in digital form. And then, you know, when something happens, you can sort of, you know, test the digital version, do diagnosis of what problems there are, see if you make a certain intervention on that device, see what happens to it. 
And it's been a very powerful idea, really motivating for a lot of the Internet of Things uh, world, which is trying to put sensors on everything so that your, your digital twin could match in behavior and in modeling what's happening in the real world very closely. And I think that, that as AI gets more powerful, as 5G comes in, as Internet of Things comes in, I think we're going to see that for essentially every complex system is going to have a digital version. And the piece that I think you and I have talked a lot about is, well, one of the most important systems are people and that there should be a kind of digital twin for that person. Still not completely clear how detailed that model is, but in terms of the topics we're talking about today, where the person owns that digital twin, I think it's most important to capture their values and what they care about, because then it can serve as an intermediary between them and the rest of society and represent those values. So just so we're clear, how, how is this different from the concept of an emulation uh, by Robin Hanson? Yeah, well, um, Robin is a very big thinker and he wrote this book about M's, E-M. Um, and he, in that book, was primarily talking about, uh, what he's talking about, brain uploads. And so this is a sort of half science fiction, half real concept that eventually sometime, in the probably not near future, there'll be the capacity to scan your entire brain, figure out every connection that you've got, hopefully in a non-destructive way, and create a digital program that essentially is you. I think that's, that's his premise in that book. And so much of society would, instead of be happening in the, the physical world, would happen in this digital world with these little emulations, human emulations, playing out their behavior. I personally am not attracted to that notion. I have no personal desire to be living inside of a computer or something. And yet I believe that a kind of restricted version of that, this personal AI concept, uh, will have tremendous implications for our physical world and our physical interactions. And so I see them as very different concepts. And yet that his book is really quite interesting. He considers uh, what are the economic consequences of these M's in particular, wealthy M's probably will have access to more computer power and they'll be able to run at a faster pace. Uh, less powerful, less uh, wealthy M's will probably only get a little bit of power and maybe live in a kind of, uh, you know, a slum in the digital world. So it's, it's a fascinating book, but I think of it more as mind expanding kind of science fiction than as something that's going to have much uh, impact, at least in the next few decades. Right, so the idea of a digital twin is that it exists while we're alive in this body before we've uploaded you know, our, our, our brain or, or modeled and uploaded. So uh, you, you mentioned that a, a, so this digital tw twin will model our beliefs and desires. Uh, how would this change the world? So let's start with advertising, for example. So let's call it personal AI, just to sort of distinguish it, because digital twin is something that has a real, uh, has, a, has a definition already. Uh, and is quite widely used in the industrial world. Uh, personal AI, I think, is a little different. It's, it's related to the, to the digital twin idea. Um, it's uh, something that it serves both to, to filter what comes into you. And so that's relevant to advertising. Today, you know, if, somebody, if YouTube wants to show you an ad, they're going to pick what ad they're going to show you. Uh, they would like to show you an ad that you're likely to respond to and enjoy. So they have some interest in making sure the ads they show you are sort of relevant to you. But they also, if they can, they would like to manipulate you. If they can show you an ad which will make you get all excited about that product and buy it, um, then advertisers are more likely to be on their platform. And so the interests of a YouTube in showing you ads are partly aligned with you, but partly not aligned with you. Now imagine that you have a personal AI that uh, serves as an interface. You don't just directly go and watch YouTube. Your personal AI is sort of negotiates with YouTube and says, all right, we'll, we'll watch an ad. You know, part of your business model is we get to watch free videos if we watch your ads, but we're not gonna accept any ad. We're only gonna accept ads that are really matching the values of my owner. In particular, my owner really doesn't like violence. So any ads that have no violence, you know, that have violence in them, we don't wanna see it. And so in that way, the, the individual, the person is empowered to start pushing back on ads. And so, uh, manipulative ads, spam ads, ads that uh, maybe are promoting products that are addictive, things like that. Maybe products that you know aren't aren't aligned with your philosophical values. Say you uh, are an animal lover and you don't want to see any products that have you know animals were killed involved with something like that. 
You can, your personal life, I can know that. Right, or I'm, a, or I'm an alcoholic and I don't want to see ads that, you know, trigger my, my addiction. Exactly. Um, but this so is an way it becomes an, a hugely empowering force. And that's great for the individual. Now, all of a sudden, the ads I'm seeing are things I want to see. And, you know, there is a thought among marketers that if ads get good enough, you know, they would love to make ads so good that people would be willing to pay for them. And in fact, there's sort of a general movement for advertising and education and entertainment all to kind of blend into a single thing, whether that's whether you view that as good or bad. Um, I would love to say, I like ads. I really enjoy having uh, products shown to me in a way that really, you know, exhibits what, what is beautiful and valuable about them. I don't like being manipulated by ads. And so, so this is, I think, an opportunity. advertisers become much more aligned with their the interests of their users. Okay, I think there's a little glitch there for a second on my end. Okay, uh, so um, in terms in terms of, sorry, there was just a, a connection issue. In terms of advertising and in that relationship with advertisers, how how would the personal AI mediate that relationship in terms of data um, and what data it would share with the advertisers? Is it my algorithm interacting with uh, the advertiser's algorithm or, or, or like you said, um, maybe, maybe product placement becomes so um, intensified that I actually decide, hey, I wanna share my data and I wanna be in the product placement, right? So how, how do you envision personal AI in the relationship of, of data with, with the advertisers? Yeah, so so that's um, sort of what, it, so, so uh, I think the personal AI serves to filter what's coming in to protect me against things I don't wanna see, maybe even viewpoints I don't wanna see. Um, a lot of people have been talking about YouTube as sort of radicalizing people because maybe out of curiosity, you watch a certain video and then it thinks you like that video and it shows you more extreme versions and pretty soon you're seeing all kinds of extreme stuff. Um, and so I think it has an impact on that incoming stream. It also has an impact on the outgoing stream. Um, right now, you're, you leave traces everywhere you go. And a lot of people in this conference are talking about data dignity and, and you should own your data and can you protect it? I think those are very interesting um, uh, uh, explorations. In the longer term, you know, data kind of has a tendency to leak all over the place. and so. I think it's gonna be challenging to really maintain control on data. But um, I think where, we, where the sweet spot is, is maintaining control on how people use that data. And so in particular, I think there should be a knob when you're interacting with a particular channel, say YouTube, you get to say how much of your data and which of your data is, can be used in deciding to show you ads. And so if you decide to give it no data, well, it's gonna show you ads that will be just based on very generic uh, things like maybe where you live, something like that. Um, and so you're not gonna see very relevant ads. If you get in a lot of data, you're gonna see ads which are very relevant. And so I think the individual should be empowered to choose how much of their personal, and like you say, maybe some people wanna be the star of their ad. So I wanna see, I just, I'm in, I'm in the market for a new car. I don't wanna just see cars. I wanna see cars with me driving them. And advertisers would love to do that because the more they can sort of show, you know, the, the particular person sort of engaging with their product, you know, the more exciting their product seems. And so there's, there's an interesting trade-off there, uh, which I think has huge potential to become more win-win, to, to align interests uh, more directly. And I think personal AI gives the, the user the choice in, in how to set that. It's, there's an interesting uh, question there, right, about the age of consent, right? You can imagine younger folks just, uh, say, dialing down the privacy knob and giving away as much data about themselves, right, to, to, to see them and see themselves in product placement. I mean, and again, and right, the, 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 the distinction between recreation and advertising sort of starts to blur, like Netflix and advertising <laughs> starts to blur there. Um, oh, very much. So, I mean, we have that problem big time now with material, you know, television programs aimed at children. They often celebrate candy, eat more candy and sweet stuff and get, eat this cereal and all this kind of thing. And so it's a battle. It's a real battle. And 
like with the, the Amazon Alexa, which is a wonderful device. Kids love this device because they get to ask it questions and say things. But the original version, you know, it, it, it would allow you to sort of abuse it and make commands and so on. And parents were saying that Alexa was turning their kids into jerks because they would start addressing their parents like, you know, mother, tell me the definition of bread, you know, something like that. And so I think children is a special case because the parents really have control over um, the experience of the child. And so our devices and our technology should respect that relationship. And so I think the personal AI of children uh, will be hooked into the personal AI of the parents and that that relationship should, you know, limit what the child is able to do. So, so the question is, right, so there's, what's, what's the relationship with, with big tech, say companies like Google? And, and I want to go back to this distinction about, about data and data dignity you mentioned. Um, so the distinction is about use and control over the data, right? And so data dignity tries to separate those things and, and big tech has, has captured those things and basically a monopoly and monopsony uh, over, uh, over data. So it seems like there could be different models for personal, for personal AI, right? There's the, um, there, let's call it paranoid personal AI where, right, I, I, I control all my data and uh, there's an algorithm that models it, and only my algorithm is maybe interacting with, say, big tech algorithms that are and negotiating with advertisers there, right? And then there's another model, maybe that's more more of a federated learning, where where I dial down the knob and 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 I let um, you know uh, big tech AI come and and use my data in a limited in a limited sense, and then kick it out if I want to kick it out, right? And then there's the free for all. Let's just give. Uh, use and control to to big tech AI. Do you see uh, any? Uh, do, do you see big tech personal AI as inevitable, and and do you see that as uh, problematic in some ways? Because I they already have an advantage, right? I think it's absolutely inevitable. I mean, all the big tech companies are are using you know developing AI like mad. The, the rise of big tech, you know, seven of the 10 biggest companies right now are big tech companies that are what, what people are calling platform companies, which serve to connect a producer with consumers. And the technology which has enabled that is AI, a very simple form of AI called recommender engines, which is figuring out what things to, you know, what um, producers to show to particular consumers and to do that matchup. And so, you know, companies like Alibaba are, uh, you know, a very simp simple recommender engine has driven them very, very rapidly to became, become extremely powerful. And I think they see going forward that uh, AI is getting better and better and much more sophisticated AI is coming and that that's going to make those relationships much more powerful and it's going to make those companies more powerful. And so I think they are full on, especially companies, you know, like, like uh, Google, and Facebook and uh, the Chinese uh, tech companies, they're you know, uh, moving ahead very, very quickly. The largest startup in the world is ByteDance, which is the parent of TikTok, it was just valued at $140 billion, primarily based on TikTok's recommender engine. You know, TikTok shows you little 15 second videos that other TikTok users create, and it's uh, intoxicating. It's, uh, they do a really good job of showing you videos that you like, and they measure when you swipe, how much you swipe. And so they're gaining information about your preferences. And I think most TikTok users don't feel manipulated or, or don't dislike that. And they like the idea that uh, every TikTok video you see is something that you find funny or engaging or humorous or whatever your uh, desire is. And so that's an example, I think, of a company which has made huge amounts of money, has huge power, based on very simple AI. Now let's ramp that up to really intelligent AI, which can say, interpret what you say, how you speak, the tone of voice, your emotional state, your journey through time. Uh, the opportunity for manipulation in an abusive way is huge, but also the opportunity to really present you an experience that is very life enhancing is also huge. And I think this idea of personal AI gives you a handle on that uh, interaction. Where I see it going longer term is very detailed, uh, a form of, of contracting between your agent and the, the big company, big tech agents, where you agree with, you know, on exactly what you're going to allow and disallow. And it's way more than just data. It 
data is important, data is nice, but that's just a proxy for what we really care about. What we really care about is what is my interaction with this thing like? What are they going to do with, you know, I've just interacted with them. Are they going to tell my neighbors that I just bought this or that? Or is that going to be limited? I want that as part of the rules of a contract. Today, if I wanted to have that contract, I'd have to hire lawyers. It'd be complicated text, very expensive. The cost of contracting is very high today. But if we had AI agents, which were actually intelligent, really understood English, really understood the rules of contracting, could negotiate in a powerful way, then every single interaction can have behind it very detailed contracts that say exactly what's allowed and what's not allowed, way beyond just limitations on data and privacy. Right. But, but going back a, sec, a, a step, um, so you think, uh, let's just call it, say, big tech, like right, Google, for example, uh, would be in the best position because they have access to most more data right now to build our own personal AIs for us. Is that, is that what you're saying? You know, to or, 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 or how would I build my own personal AI without big tech? That's another way to frame the question. So, so AI is moving ahead really rapidly. The most powerful form of AI today is something called deep learning systems, which are big neural networks, which are you know, trying to mimic the way the brain works. And today they require quite a lot of data to train them and be effective. And so uh, training data for AIs has been a big topic uh, recently. And so some people have thought, you know, and there are companies that will label data for you so you can train your AI and those companies are making money. The latest and greatest AI, though, doesn't need a lot of training data. It's built on, say, text gotten from the internet. And once that base AI is built, tuning it to a particular task or to a particular instance or person becomes is a very simple thing. So I think the huge necessity of data uh, in building AIs is a momentary blip. Um, all of these algorithms, at least many of them, are being published open source. In fact, in many cases, it's on, they're on GitHub. You can just download you know, the, some of the very best language models and run them on your own computers. And so um, the opportunity for a kind of an open source AI and for a community of people that build individual AIs that are tuned to very specific individual needs, I think that's very likely. I also think there are going to be companies building uh, these personal AIs. And there's a challenge there that you have to make sure that the interests of the company and the interests of the user who's buying it aren't at odds with one another. And so developing ways that individuals can develop trust with their AI, because if you're gonna offload a lot of your choices and experience to your personal AI, you better trust it. You better believe that it is the way it is. One of the most powerful, amazing aspects of AIs is you can look inside their brains. For a person, you know, if you hire an attorney to represent your interests, he may, you know, say, I'm, you know, I will represent your interests, and da, 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 but you don't really know what he's thinking, right? But if you have an AI that is supposed to represent your interests, in principle, you can check the connections and the logic and everything and make sure that it really has your interests. Now, you as a person probably don't want to do that, but you can have other AIs that serve to check and make sure that this AI doesn't have anything hidden in it. So there's a potential of radical transparency in using AIs to understand what their real values and interests and uh, goals are. And so I think that some of that kind of technology will, will serve in validating that this AI is really doing what you think it is and that it really has your interest in heart. And if we get to that point, then those AIs could also be made by big companies and we could trust them. Uh, mm -hmm. That's certainly a huge area of, it, of uh, interest though. Right. We, we talked about this subfield called explainable AI. And I think, is, is this sort of what you're talking about where, you know, uh, if we want to look at, say, a decision to block a certain ad, what's the re rationale behind it? What you're saying is that uh, another algorithm could come and tell us what that interface with our AI and tell us what, the, or, or say, say audit, audit the, the algorithm and confirm the, you know, the rationale behind it. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I think that's the first step, which is, um, you know, this AI makes a classification. This is an ad which is not appropriate. Well, why did it say that? Well, because it features people drinking alcohol and you don't want to see ads like that. So at least, you know, in this case, it did the right thing. But what you'd really like is, I like the word you just used, auditable. You'd like auditable AI or even better, you'd like to be sure that this AI has nobody else's hidden interest built into it, that it's 
really um, all about what you care about. And that's a kind of transparent AI where you can, you can sort of know the, the entirety of, of, its, of the values that it's based on. And we're not at the point where we can do that yet. But in principle, AIs are computer programs and you can analyze programs and understand what they do. And so I see that as a direction going forward that uh, has the potential for huge. Same for politicians. Today, we have human politicians that make promises during their you know, election. And then once they're elected, well, they sometimes follow their promises, they sometimes don't. If you had an AI politician, you could have absolute uh, certainty, guarantees that they're going to follow, you know, the things that they said they were going to do during the right. during the election. I don't know. It seems. It seems. I don't know. This. It seems sort of like. Uh, uh, I don't know. A AI is building on AIs. When I have algorithms fact checking other algorithms, it, it makes me a little bit nervous, right? Because who, who right? Ultimately, where does it stop? But um, but let, I'll, I'll suspend that 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 uh, that uncertainty, and let's just take a step back and and. Let's let's think about so you say this idea of the personal AI is that it empowers the individual, right? And modeled off of your beliefs and desires. But say, what if my, you know, what if I'm a racist, for example, um, and uh, my personal AI is just going to continue to feed um, feed that? Or say say you know uh, say even even we don't have to even take that extreme. Say I have sort of multiple facets to myself, right? I have a, you know, there's a lower self and a higher self, which is a crude concept, right? So it seems like there's opportunity to have multiple personal AIs. Um, uh, I think schizophrenia is another extreme, right? Where you really have multiple personal AIs. But um, in the case of where, where my beliefs uh, around, you know, about the world are maybe false or, or maybe I have some, um, uh, I'm broken in some way, or I need, I have some trauma and uh, that needs, and my personal AI is continuing to feed that, right? So say like back to the racism example, how do we, how do we rectify that? I mean, it seems like you need some sort of socially mediated, uh, social mediation um, of your personal AI with, with other AIs, uh, or what do you think? Yeah, that's, I think, a, a really interesting and important issue. In some sense, you know, today a person using Google is a different creature than a person on their own. And so we already have a kind of, Google in some sense is a kind of personal AI in that it is building a model of you as you do searches. It sees what you click on, what you like, what you don't like, and it shows you more of what you like. Uh, there was the term, the filter bubble that was put out a few years back of uh, saying that that process of social media and Google and some of the other sources tracking your interests and showing you more of what you like tends to sort of make you see things through the lens of what you already believe in. And in the case of extremist views, white supremacist or something, um, that could be really damaging and dangerous. And some people think that that has really happened. There have been articles saying that uh, YouTube in particular, its algorithm for showing you videos that you're gonna like uh, tends to push people in more radical directions. And so I, I think you're absolutely right that your personal AI, that there's a, a possibility of that happening. Um, I'm sort of in favor of individual empowerment. And so if you're not a, uh, you know, a child under control of a parent or a mentally ill person under control of something else, I would say that you should be in charge of, you know, let's say you know that you're vulnerable to this uh, filter bubble thing. Maybe you want to have your personal AI show you allow in of other viewpoints. And uh, maybe you could have it tell you when you seem to be veering off in a certain direction. The social aspect of that is very interesting. Um, society's interest, I think, is certainly to have people um, more tolerant of different viewpoints than their own. And so I would certainly be in favor of social AIs and societal AIs, which may be um, you know, give you feedback there. Whether you want that to, to get into your personal AI, that's a, that's a really interesting question of control. Um, you know, it sounds like you would be more in favor of, say, society deciding that, oh, there are certain things you're not allowed to do with your personal AI. 
And uh, I don't know quite quite where to, where I stand on that, but that that's a really interesting dimension. Yeah, no, I'm not. I, I don't have a view on it one way or the other, but I I do think one of the problems that we've seen uh, in uh, big tech, as you mentioned, is uh, the sort of radicalization uh, uh, where right um, the algorithms, for example, YouTube just feed <laughs> fake news, for example, right. Um, and that earns money, and so that's that's a that's a problem in the in the advertising model. So what's exciting about the idea of data dignity is that we separate out the control and use of that data, and and I think there's an application here with AI where um, you we can also if you separate out the control and use of data and build a as I was saying those sort of different models of AI based off of the access of data, you can also build. AIs that are not just necessarily on the individual level, but um, on the group level. And, and for people who do care about data dignity, one of the ideas uh, is this idea of mediators of individual data or, or MIDs. Um, and the idea is that, you know, given, given the network effects um, that platforms have and this disproportionate power they have and the complexity, you know, the digital economy, um, in order for the concept of data dignity and separating control and use of data to work, you have to have this layer of organizations of you know, intermediate size to bridge that gap and have some sort of negotiating power. And um, it seems like for people who value their data and, and, and move in the data digni dignity direction, we might get um, mid AIs before we get personal AIs, right? And that there's going to sort of be a uh, spectrum of AIs from the individual to sort of the group level. And you can imagine people participating in multiple communities of AIs, right? There's my, my law school mid, my playground mid, my family mid, right? And I have all kinds of entanglements and, and then my personal AI as well um, thrown in there or multiple personal AIs, right? Depending on what time you find me in the, in the day, right? <laughs> like my morning AI is different from my evening personal AI. The, like different recommendations or not different recommendations, but maybe even like different, uh, you know, beliefs and values. I won't, I won't be that extreme, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it seems like we, it, it seems possible that we have uh, participation in, in uh, not just multiple uh, groups of AIs, but like multiple scales of AIs. And so how do you see uh, those? Do, do you see that? Or is that, or do you see us sort of moving in one, us one scale direction, personal AIs generally versus big tech AIs, or, or do you see a more diverse diverse plane of AIs developing? Oh, I totally agree. I think there will be AIs representing the interests of every level at which there's, an, there's a kind of organization or entity which has some kind of perspective. And so um, particularly for, like you were mentioning, you know, professional organizations or groups that are you know, producing music that, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, like some of the music groups that serve uh, to, to negotiate for musicians. Um, I think having AIs representing those interests, creating contracts, creating uh, negotiation, absolutely. And I think it's going to go all the way up to the scale of global AIs. I mean, the, the whole of humanity has certain interests. I mean, that we're struggling right now with pandemic, with global warming, with uh, you know, pollution with uh, floods, with you know, all kinds of stuff that um, should be represented by an intelligent agent that captures the interests of the whole of humanity. And I see this whole multi-scale AI um, as being ultimately informed by the individual. I mean, if we we view this as primarily human society, then those uh, personal AIs can serve to represent and capture the interests of a particular person and aggregate them in a powerful semantic way all the way up to the global AI so that uh, we gather the actual interests of the whole of humanity in making uh, decisions that affect each, each individual. When you say semantic way, what do you mean exactly? Well, today we have mechanisms, I and mean, there's a lot of uh, speaking in this conference about uh, new ideas like quadratic voting. Uh, for aggregating the interests of individuals in a way that, that captures them better so that we get, you know, what is the actual interest of this group? Quadratic voting is a brilliant idea that um, enables somebody to not just say whether they like an idea or not, but to express in, a, in an economically 
uh, correct, incentivized way, how much they care about that idea. But still, you can only, you know, you vote on one out of five possibilities or three different candidates. You pick which one you want. That's incredibly low amount of information. So like in my local community in this, this town, we vote on bills. So, okay, we need to give more money to schools. Oh, we need to give more money to repair the streets. Let's say I care a lot about, you know, the science club at the school. I really want the science club to get more money. I don't care so much about sports or I care about streets be having, you know, being really good for bicyclists and I don't care about the other aspects. I should be able to express the detailed, subtle aspects of what I care about and have that aggregated rather than somebody's choice of, is it, you know, do we do bill A or bill B? And so, uh, and also today we vote maybe, you know, once a year or something, really there should be continuous improvement. There was this guy, uh, Edwards Deming back in the uh, 1950s who revolutionized the way that Japan does manufacturing by enabling, by empowering every single assembly line worker to make suggestions for how his job could be done better. And it revolutionized ja the whole of Japanese industry to make them uh, so that they had you know, zero defect and uh, the idea of Kaizen, continual improvement. I think we should do that at the societal level, that your personal AI can serve as input so as it knows what you care about and what you, your perceptions. Why not aggregate all of that and make societal decisions in a way that really takes account of the details of the individual's uh, desires and beliefs. Uh, I think that's a, it seems a little bit scary to me though. I mean, right, this idea of a global AI that's sort of aggregating all these personal AIs because you know, what's that global AI's algorithm? I mean, what, 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 what is it optimizing for, right? Um, I mean, may, may, you know, I, I, for example, like plurality and uh, this idea of participation and having a sort of complex identity and participating in multiple AIs. But if there's sort of a global AI that's managing or, or say manipulating um, those, those interactions um, of, of personal AIs to optimize for some outcome. Um, uh, it, it should be optimizing for the interests of the whole of humanity. And uh, I totally agree. The, the opportunity for corruption and misuse is huge. And so the need for transparency at those very large scales is way more powerful, more important than even at the, at the individual scale. And I would say things like a global AI should really only be there for global problems, you know, for things like global warming. And that, you, as you were mentioning, you have a hierarchy of AIs that represent the interests of groups at different levels. Right. So maybe that's what's key, right, is sort of thinking about what are the problems that certain AIs are well adapted to solve. So for example, like a, uh, you know, the federated learning model AI, right, where we, 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 we dial the privacy notch down, right? So there's privacy preserving and the algorithms can come and just touch, um, you know, the data. That's really useful for, say, healthcare data, which is, um, you know, we, we, most people uh, have a lot, have a high degree of preference for privacy for their health da healthcare data, but it's also incredibly useful to be able to access uh, large amounts of healthcare data across diverse populations, right? Developing vaccines, for example. Um, so maybe that's a situation where, um, uh, you know, a federated learning AI makes sense. And maybe a, a, another situation where a global, as you said, global AI for collective action, public good, public good problems, that makes more sense. Uh, personal AIs, uh, you know, blocking ads, okay, that, that, that aren't relevant to my beliefs and desires, but it seems like the, the, on the news side, there does need to be some sort of like uh, social mediation, not necessarily social, truth and social mediation, right? Something that's like sensors plus, right, um, you know, so, some connection to my, my child good playground mid AI, so I don't get too, right? So if I become radicalized and extreme, right? I get some sort of data points that, hey, I have this other community of people that I love and deeply care about who believe something very different than I do. And then I have to sort of work through that. Um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, it's dangerous territory where we're thinking about creating structures which will uh, impose the will of those structures on the individual. And so uh, I think we take those steps very carefully. And I, I guess my own bias is, like you mentioned, censorship. 
My own bias is not so much for censorship, but for transparency. And so um, like today, I think many of the social media platforms are starting to label, you know, oh, this information about the COVID virus, it does not align with what um, the World Health Organization says. And so that kind of thing seems great. Um, if you just delete anything that disagrees with the World Health Organization, um, then I think you've disempowered the individual. And so balancing that, uh, that trade-off is very, very tricky, and especially when it comes to news. And you know, for a long time, we've had these uh, you know, news sources like the New York Times, which you know, are sort of uh, viewed as having vetted their stories and, and representing the truth. That issue of what is true and what's not true is about, AI is about to make that much, much more challenging. This uh, GPT-3 language model uh, is the first language model which can generate large amounts of text which humans cannot distinguish from human written text. And so we're entering into a time when you'll have these AI models that can generate text, uh, images, audio, video, that is indistinguishable from truth to an unaided uh, human eye. And that enables you know, somebody that's got an agenda to generate say a million tweets promoting their agenda with detailed backup and data and all kinds of stuff very, very rapidly and very cheaply. And so I think we're about to enter into a time when our channels, our news channels in particular are gonna be flooded with information that is representing somebody's agenda and it's not necessarily true. We're gonna absolutely need what I've been calling a truth machine, some way to get ground reality uh, into this whole thing. And I think the personal AI is helping there exactly how to do it, how to get groups that validate that, you know, this video was really taken at this time by this camera, by this person. Having that ground truth underneath our news infrastructure is gonna, gonna be very important. How we get there is not at all clear to me. Yeah, so Steve, we only have a few minutes left. I wanna take some questions here. Um, on the truth machine stuff though, just quickly, as long as there's zeros and ones, right? as long as we have sensors connecting the physical world and trans, uh, transferring what's happening in the physical world into zeros and ones, then I think, right, there's a whole question about, um, you know, manipulation and algorithms and really knowing for sure, right, this question of auditing algorithms, um, you know, what is the truth? Um, so, it, right. As, as soon as it, as, as soon as physical aspects of the world become digitized and are interacting with algorithms, then um, it's uh, an algorithm tops of algorithms, and it's hard to. Um, I, I think it's a philosophical question about how you actually un, uh, can confirm and validate truth with, within that um, with certainty. Well, the blockchain world is struggling with that right now because you can have smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain that say, that, you know, if it rains in Tallahassee tomorrow, pay me this amount of money, it needs to know, did it rain in Tallahassee or not? And so they've yeah. developed all kinds of Oracle-like technology. Very yeah. interesting tech that I think is still in its early stages. Right. Okay, so let's do a quick question here. Um, have you thought about how this, this is from Adam, have you thought about how this could help with voter fatigue? Uh, will personal ads be empowering democratic processes in the future? Absolutely. I think that's one of the possibly biggest benefits that we no longer will rely on a person having to go to a voting booth and making a decision and this and that. If your personal AI is really good and knows what you care about, it can continuously in real time, all the time, give your government your um, perspective on whatever issues are, are arising. So if the structure is built properly, it can enable way more voter engagement than our current processes. Right. Here's another question. Doesn't this just put off the responsibility of building trust in our communities and learning how to communicate as human beings and face the power imbalances? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I would say none of this is in lieu of human trust. And my personal hope would be that if we have a trusted sort of AI infrastructure, that that opens up space for people to interact in much more authentic and real and human ways and that we don't need to be stuck in this morass of uh, manipulative news and advertising that is pushing our emotions one way or another. So my hope is that this will lead to more authentic and human trust. But I'm totally sympathetic with the, the questioner to that perspective. This gets back to the question about uh, big, you know, 
big tech building our personal AIs for us. Um, Silicon Valley and VCs do not take our best interests into account very carefully. Personal AIs with profit-driven motives seems scary. Yeah, I think there's going to be trade-offs there. Though it's interesting that um, the large platforms um, in a world in which there's no pushback on manipulative content, uh, manipulative content will get more engagement, more click through, and they'll make more money on it. In a world in which um, people are demanding uh, authentic, clear uh, channels and control over their data, the platforms would like to provide that, right? I mean, they want to give people what they want so that they want to be on those platforms. And so I think, you know, it, it, I don't think it's really an us and them situation. I think the big platforms actually would like it if uh, individuals were empowered in this way. And so I think they will support it uh, once, you know, viable uh, proposals come forward. So you think like, uh, so big tech would, would build a personal AI that's so good, it shows me ads that I'm willing to pay for? Yeah, or I think they would love that because ads that you're willing to pay for are ads that you're gonna be really engaged with. And those are ads that, that advertisers are gonna pay huge amounts of money to show you. And so they would love it. If you never ever saw an ad you hated again, that would be, that would make their profits go through the roof. And so they actually are aligned with their users in that way. Mm -hmm. So could person, another question, could personal AIs be an agent on behalf of the natural human uh, interacting with, with MIDS? Um, yeah, so I, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely think so. I mean, my sense is, I mean, you brought up the point that you may want more than one personal AI to represent different aspects of yourself. Um, whether that should be viewed as a single AI, which knows that you're currently in the state, which is more, you know, lyrical or more analytic, something like that, it's not clear to me. Uh, but I envision this as being your interface to all other entities which you have interactions with and want to contract with. In particular, the the mids, um, you know, would be a perfect example where your interests are going to be very aligned with other people in your mid but maybe a little different. Maybe you care more about certain aspects of the agreements that that mid makes and you can promote those, your AI can promote those and you have ways of negotiating and aggregating um, all the, the members of that mid. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Could personal AI shift the influence from the company on the user to the user on the company? Yeah, I think, I think so. Right. Both, I mean, we've talked about news and, and the, the pushing back against uh, manipulative and fake news. We've talked about advertising. I think it also happens in the value chain. Today, when you buy something, the fact that you paid a certain price for it, that goes up the value chain, but nothing about why or what you care about. Imagine if you could say, I'm only going to buy something which preserved uh, human rights and animal rights dur dur during the entire value chain. And if that information ripples up in a semantic way, now all of a sudden you can put pressure on companies to avoid you know, abusive manufacturing processes, for example. Okay, last question. I wonder if systems will start peeking into the personal AIs and, and block personal AIs that have beliefs that might work against the goals of the system. Mm. Certainly you would want to have control over, you, know, you would not want other people, other systems able to look inside your AI unless you allowed that. And then that would definitely be a risk. You would definitely not want people peeking into your personal AI. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that's, that's something to be worried about. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have two more minutes. Uh, so here's one more question. How does radical transparency, quote unquote, square with the black box nature of most machine learning algorithms right now? It seems like we could not understand their intentions clearly. Yeah, AI, you know, machine learning is in a very early stage, I would say. I expect, you know, we're just, we talked a little bit about explainable AI. I mean, mm -hmm. systems are just barely able to talk about how they come up with specific answers. I expect the next generation of AI, like even if you look at this GPT-3, you can talk to it in English. You can tell it to do things in English and I expect it'll be able to explain itself in English. And so I think we're, we're gonna enter into a new era and that that's a very important era to go forward so that we can be sure these systems are doing what we think they're doing. Okay, Steve, well, I think our time is up. That was a lot a lot to, to process. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and hopefully we can have this conversation again. 
Great. Thank you. Okay. Great. Take care. Bye-bye.